Hello and welcome to the GMBN podcast. This week we're going to be talking about free ride, the current state of it, where the sport is heading and who better to guide us through this conversation than our two very own free ride aficionados, Blake Sampson and Chris Smith. How are you doing guys? All good, thank you. Thank you very good. much. So I kind of want to talk about, you know, free ride is something I really enjoy as a spectator, mm -hmm. but it's something that I probably, well, I, I don't have first hand experience of in the in the truest sense of almost the art form that is so it'd be really interesting to hear your perspectives mm -hmm. and just kind of going back to where it all began both born kind of early to mid 80s 85 81 yeah i imagine very different you were born in zimbabwe trowbridge is trowbridge is probably yeah. a little different to yeah probably a little bit different to where you grew up right <laughs> well do you know what i had nothing to do with mountain biking when i was born yeah. Until I moved to England. So, oh, really? Which was, I was moved here when I was 15. Oh, okay. And I, that's when I picked up a magazine. Yeah. And I saw Chris Smith, <laughs> Grant Fielder, <laughs> Chopper, yeah. Yeah. all those boys. And then that's where it kind of started. And for you, Chris, when did you start riding, prop, you know, as a mountain biker? Um, as a mountain biker, I was quite late to the party. Like, kind of, I was like 12, 13. I used a bike, like, before that. It's like a mode of transport, mm -hmm. mostly like BMX. Mm -hmm. um, and that sort of turned into trials and then sort of to where we are today. So, yeah, I was quite late to it, to be fair. And do you, um, you know, growing up before, before, you know, for me, when I found biking, it was like, oh, my God, this is what I've been waiting for, you know? Before you found bikes, what was... Were you kind of outdoorsy kids? Were you sport, sporty? What was your kind of childhood like? Uh, for me, well, being in Zimbabwe born, I was born on a farm. So yeah. outdoors was my thing. Yeah. Never indoors. And the weather was good out there. Uh, he had some cold days, but the first thing I got, my dad got us into was BMXing. Yeah. So he built a BMX track in our back garden. We're wow. pretty lucky. We had loads of, we had a bit of land. And... Um, yeah, we, I just I took up BMXing with my brother. Uh, I followed in my steps, footsteps, my cousin's footsteps, because mm -hmm. they started BMX racing. So yeah. we wanted to be them. We wanted to do what they were doing. Mm -hmm. So it was just like quite tr quite a natural progression to follow them, follow them doing BMXing, go to the races in the main city, which was Harare, mm -hmm. where I was born, um, and then from there just moved on to motocross. And what was the scene like in Zimbabwe? Was there a, oh, a strong BMX scene? Yeah, it was pretty yeah. big. I was I started riding when I was five. My mm -hmm. brother was four. Mm -hmm. uh, we competed against each other. We were pretty... It was first, second, second, yeah. first, first, second, second, first. We had a battle between each other. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, it was it was big. But then to a point where we moved to quite... The next farm we moved to was far away from the city. Mm. So we started doing motorbikes, like enduro racing. Mm. And then that BMX track turned into... a motocross track yeah and then it's just we followed our cousins what they did we did yeah so I, that I was, was it i have a similar relationship with my yeah, cousins yeah there. and chris because you spend a bit of time on a moto now mm. and that's not a bigger e-bike so it's yeah. a legitimate <laughs> motorbike was that something you did before mountain biking or did you kind of yeah i've always been like well into like the motorbike trial stuff i followed that for ages and i've ridden like um we do this thing called time trials which is kind of like enduring format but you have judge sections per lap oh yeah you've got to keep your feet up in those i really enjoyed doing them and put a lot of focus into them and a lot mm -hmm. of training i rode like expert in a lot of trials like local trials stuff and to this day i still ride trials motorbike and enduro and mixing it up as well <laughs> i think it's a real good crossover sport you find all these places and the stuff you can do on a moto makes riding like your bike a lot easier yes. i think so it's pretty cool it sounds like both of you from an early age already were developing a relationship between risk and reward and two wheels and two wheels <laughs> <laughs> yeah but i find that really interesting i feel like you know with a downhill racing or something it's objective mm -hmm. he was the he or she was the fastest person down the hill on that day mm -hmm. how do you know Blake, when you come up to do something on perhaps something that's never been done before you or you're building a feature, how much is that? What motivates you to push those boundaries of risk and reward? I think the the reward is landing that trick that I've always wanted to do. Mm. The risk will come with it. But when you're practicing a trick, well, the biggest one for me was a 360 double tail whip. Mm. Now, back then was quite a big thing. Yes, Nowadays, yeah. it's like <laughs> they do it off drops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, that was the the reward from doing that was... The feeling of landing that trick mm. and the motivation to actually nail that trick, mm. especially for a video, mm. which is quite high. I like that. And I loved doing that. Mm. It's, just, it's like anything, really. And what I always loved about watching your videos, Chris, you know, when mm. growing up and just seeing 
like you said, your MBUK and these yeah, huge yeah. kind of quarry stuff, mm -hmm. is that, you know, there must be, I think, you know, when people talk about drive and cycling and motivation, they often talk about cross country and, and racing and that, but it must be a huge amount of drive to distinguish, this is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. Perhaps no one around me is even doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, for you hunting out spots in the, in the southwest of yeah. quarries and stuff like that, would you, would you say you were really driven to do it or was it just an expression of passion? I don't know. I think I've visited pretty much every quarry or derelict quarry in the southwest. Literally, I've been to all these <laughs> spots. So people are like, I'll check out this spot. And I've said, oh, yeah, I've been there. It's pretty limited and stuff. But yeah. the, I think what dro drove me in those early days was like, I like being scared, I think, mm -hmm. and actually conquering being scared. I was like, you know, you can put your two fingers up in the face of it. And yeah. like, yeah, I've done that. What's next? And what's next? What's next? And I think you build yourself up to a level and I think that progression of your riding is like hmm. really key like it's Blake says in tricks you can work up you know do your 360 then you do your 360 bar spin hmm. then you do your 360 double bar spin it's always like up and up and up to see where you can get to I think that's a really important part of like free riding dirt yeah. jumping and stuff and did that change for either of you you know maybe start with you Blake when you turn professional and suddenly it's a livelihood hmm. was that financial pressure a motivator or was it a bit like oh my god I've got Got to put some food on the table. Yeah, well, I started, I was quite young. Mm. So my profession, I was, I got sponsored when I was 18. I was quite late because mm -hmm. I moved to the country along like 15. So I started doing tricks when I was 16. I did mm. a backflip when I was 17. Yeah, wow. So the progression was, I would, it was real content. It was like concentrated mm. to get as many tricks and as dialed as quick as possible because you know, people were starting when they were 13. Sam Pilgrim was doing it when he was like mm -hmm. 10, mm -hmm. even doing flips at that age or something mm -hmm. like that. Whereas I was doing it at 18. So the motivation to get to a point where, right, I need to do this as a living, mm -hmm. uh, it got hard, mm -hmm. I'm not gonna lie. Uh, but I was young, I was mm -hmm. staying at mum and dad's. Yeah. So mum and dad, they were to help. And yeah. you know, the more I did, the more contests I did, and the more I got money and then got noticed, my deals got a bit better. It was like it's like a slow progression. And for you know, speaking of, of contests, I mean, you kind of, I'd say, although you both have a very scared, shared skill set, probably the way the avenues you they were slightly different, mm, you know. Yeah. But do, did you feel like you know, with with the way the sport was changing and new tricks coming up? I think you're probably in that rapid acceleration oh, of yeah. things constantly changing. Yeah, yeah. You know, did you feel? I've, this winter, I've got to learn this trick to yes. be competitive next year. Yes. Yeah. It got to that point where I was like, man, you know, I need to do flip whips mid-set, not on mm -hmm. the last jump. Mm -hmm. yeah. I need to make this thing super consistent. Mm -hmm. I need to do 360 drops or flip drops. I need to do that this year. Mm -hmm. I need to learn this this winter. Mm. So I'm ready for next year. Yeah, I think an important part of it as well was forecasting what was going to be next oh, as well, yeah. like moving, you know, like I think Blake you kind of focused more on getting that competition side of it, whereas I was like that little bit older. Mm. So for me, it was like thinking like, right, I can't do that on these bikes, so why not take it to that bike? And, you mm -hmm. know, so I started doing like tricks on my enduro mm -hmm. bike and then that turned into a slope style bike. And I was like, wow, this would be cool to do it on an enduro, mm -hmm. uh, on a downhill bike. And then you start doing your tricks on a downhill bike. So you kind of set another path, kind mm -hmm. of, so it wasn't just doing those tricks. Which is free ride. Mm -hmm. Yes. Essentially. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is you start to progress from one sport to another, to another, and then you put it in other places where people wouldn't expect to do it. Yeah. Like Mr. Ashton, I wouldn't say that's free ride, but on a, no, but on I, a road I bike. I understand, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly, yeah. Changing but, it. You know, I mean, I think dirt jump bikes, you know, maybe the slope style stuff, they have, they have, the technology has enhanced. Yeah. I think with your downhill bikes, it is world apart. Mm -hmm. Do you think at the time it was a natural progression and it was those incremental steps you were taking getting bigger and bigger was just how the sport was growing? Or did you feel perhaps it was limited by the kit you were using? You know, if you took a downhill bike from now you know you, you watch those videos of josh bender and or yeah. whatever and they land yeah. so smooth and there's no rebound yeah <laughs> it's just, just like a front door. Yeah. Yeah. always on the drops if you were a young man now with a well a younger man sorry younger man. <laughs> do you think um, it would be much different yeah i think the bikes were like it depends where you rode like if you're in a perfectly manicured like dirt jump you know set of trails like 
Leamington and places we used to ride, then a dirt jump bike was amazing. But if you wanted to take those tricks to like a derelict quarry, like the stuff I mm -hmm. rode, you simply couldn't do it or it mm -hmm. took a load, a load of work to make everything smooth. Whereas like on the downhill bikes, you could just go take a pickaxe and a spade and just yeah. go and build a line and just be like stoked with that for the day rather than, you know, do, making manicured trails. So I think the bikes definitely paved the way mm -hmm. in how you were riding as well. But I think that's something that, you know, all throughout your kind of career, I think one of the reasons that, although it's probably a limiting factor in some ways, being based in the Southwest compared to if you're living in Utah or something, yeah. I think one of the reasons that it, people found it so um, relatable was the fact that you were doing this super gnarly stuff mm -hmm. out your back door. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think yeah. that's what you saw on the cover of MBUK UK and be like, that's yeah. in the UK. That's yeah. this huge, <laughs> gnarly, super crazy thing. Yeah, I think I was super lucky with like the location and literally around my house, like within 10 minutes, there's like four or five big quarries, which <laughs> as you say, had... It was the size of the stuff that you would see out in like Utah and even the the, the stone and stuff that's there, it's like red rocks, mm -hmm. you know, grey rock. It is super cool. And like these guys used to come down and be like, whoa, yeah. this is amazing. Yeah. Like, and I just literally got used to it because it was 10 minutes out my door. So yeah. Or looking cool. at it and going, that is so sketchy. <laughs> Hell no, do that. <laughs> Little tiny landings. No, yeah. Because yeah, so. I guess there's a case to be made that free ride is a, sub, you know, a complete subjective art form. Mm -hmm. However, you know, competition is good for kind of the sport and for sponsors. And so often, you know, you look at Rampage and they do try and score it. Yeah. How do you feel about that? Do you, do you want your writing to be judged almost as an exhibition piece? Or did how did you find, you know, Blake, how did you get on the competition? Did you enjoy that aspect? I enjoyed it too. I, 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 I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, my brother was better than me. But <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, yeah, no, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, I would say my skill, my riding, because I was a goofy footed rider. Yeah. So I thought that would score me a little bit few few more points because with a certain trick i had to switch feet i remember it used to look so weird yeah, yeah. so i'm goofy so i'm right foot forward but i spin into my right foot forward right. so if you are a regular foot you if you're spinning right you're left foot forward mm -hmm. so you're spinning away from your front foot now when it come to tail whips i had to switch to front left foot forward kick the bike do a 360 kick the bike do a tail whip catch it and then whilst not even landing catch the tail whip with the 360 and then quickly switch back to right foot forward before even landing so I could, you know, get to the next trick. Or stay like that and then do a flip whip and then catch it. Mm. So there was certain elements that it I... It did look super crazy when it was, runs. Yeah, it was a bit weird, but yeah, that was... And how did you feel, Chris, with the with the kind of scoring or competition element? Um, I always, I think I was always a better rider than I was like a, not a racer, but you know, like a, mm. going to those competitions, I always like preferred riding and doing video parts and pictures because that's kind of like where I was in my career at the time. I think, you know, like when we first started doing competitions, it was like super basic tricks and stuff. And it just felt like, I don't know, it was just... The scoring wasn't like recognised and the tricks weren't recognised for what they actually were. You know, mm -hmm. you'd get scored higher on like a no-hander than you would a bar spin and like mm -hmm. the technicality of it. Like people weren't so in tune mm -hmm. with those tricks and things like that at the early stages. Yep. And I think some of the courses were a bit questionable as well, yeah. like pretty hard to trick. It's quite and, political yeah. when it comes yeah, yeah. to stuff like that. And favoured riders yeah, and stuff. Same, mm -hmm. same likewise in, but, when I was doing it. I mean, it seems, you know, as Rampage, which is on the horizon mm -hmm. as an example, people still saying, Norb's got robbed. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. I mean, how, did you ever undergo something that you thought actually that was a bloody good run and I didn't get my just desserts? Was, is that something you can sympathise with? I can I can say that with me and Dirt Wars in the UK. Yeah. It was it was mainly Sam Reynolds and myself were always kind of up against it and there's a few other people in there as well. But there was a few contests I was like, man, I did, I did so many more tricks. Mm -hmm. But then it's, it's depending on the scene. If it's on a trails, yeah. the different vibe of riding mm. gets judged a little bit more than if you were doing stunts on tra mm. on trails. Mm. Certain things like that. Yeah, it's all political. Yeah. It's been that I've done this. Yeah, I think going back to the rampage, <laughs> the rampage setup. I think like you need to either have a rider judge format or a, a viewer judge format. Mm -hmm. You know, like votes and stuff. I don't think. It's so hard, like, to be, you know, see everything that goes down and understand that so many people have got a different perspective of what a trick or a line is worth in their eyes, mm. and it's it clashes all the time. Whereas I think you need that bigger overall picture, or from the mm. riders that actually understand those lines and are experiencing it themselves. Mm. Like to trick that drop is like crazy, you know, or just to hit that drop, but let alone do a 360 down mm. it. And like people might think, oh, it's just a 360 drop, but that drop is so fast and it's on the like biggest exposed part of the course. And I think only from a rider's 
brain, you get that yeah. mm. fear and how, how much it should be worth. It's a bit like how they judge the FMB, like Crankworks, mm. Whistler. They, all the Crankworks, really, all those FMB judges, they're all old ex mm. pros. Mm. Yeah, it's Grant definitely Fielder's getting better. One of them. Definitely mm. getting better. They judge and stuff. So they, they do judge, riders do. They do a better job at judging other riders mm. instead of someone that goes, oh, I know that trick. Yeah. Or, no, that trick there looks like it's yes. way look, better looking than that one, but that one's way harder than yeah. that. And then and that's... Going back to like the thing you said about opposite foot, yeah, yeah. opposites, rotations, people know that now. And yeah. again, mm. it, it comes back to how actually hard it is. I suppose it's kind of growing pains of a sport. Mm. But those growing pains come with, you know, people such as yourselves that are preparing to push it mm -hmm. with those was there any times that you know you ever look back and you thought that risk definitely wasn't worth it or things you just thought well i'm gonna have to be scared for this and as a kind of a, a secondary question how do you cope with injury because it's almost inevitable if you're pushing the limits it's just when not a matter of yeah, if exactly that it's not i don't think it's necessarily like it can be a, a technical thing you know you bars could snap or something on a landing with a big drop but i think my worst experience was um, in Salisbury, I tried doing this big step down gap. Mm -hmm. It was like 48 feet out and about the same wow. down. So it was massive for the time. It's like in 2002. So massive. pretty seen early it. time. Yeah, you've seen it. <laughs> and, um, Sketchy ass thing. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of like stepping up and up. And I reached this level and we went to this gap jump. And I was like, yeah, I can do it. We didn't spend too long prepping it. And I just sent it anyway in a really short run up. And I thought off the basis, you know, when I've jumped off high stuff, you tend to go quite a long way out. Mm. But I totally sort of misinterpreted how long this actual gap was. Mm. It saw me jump off halfway over and I literally ditched my bike. No. And I fell like like 40 odd foot straight to my ass cheeks, like bam, on top oh, of this landing. Flipped twice down it and it snapped like my ankle real bad <sighs> as well. Broke my back in two places, mm. like compression fracture and split it. So it was quite a big thing for me, but like... That's always been on the back of my mind. Like, should I go and do it again? Like, mm. I know I can do that now and we prepped it better, but it's like, now, would I get, what would I get out of it? Yes. You know, I'd just get a few thousand likes on Facebook or, you know, a load of likes <laughs> yeah. on it. But ultimately, I could land and my front wheel could explode, I could flip over the bar, yeah. break my yeah. neck and be in a wheelchair. You yeah. know, like, yeah, it's totally. kind of like, then compared to now, it's like different risk. You know, you need to evaluate it a lot mm. more and like, you need to be riding tomorrow, mm. not off it six months do you know yeah. what i mean you need to think about like what you can actually survive and i think that's a massive part of your career is mm. making it to the next week and the next contest yeah. you really need to think about it and it's that balance of like stepping up and keeping in control like making yourself last yeah. your body last to the next thing that's coming up and is that something you sympathize with blake ah oh, 100 percent. yeah i broke my leg doing shows with um on the shows that mr ashton and I used to do the animal bike tour. Uh, I broke my leg, snapped it clean in half too. And it was hard. It was six, six months off, eight months nearly off the bike. Because wow. I thought there's a lot of riders out there that they have a big injury and they're, they're always thinking, oh, I need to be back on the bike, I need to be back on the bike. But there's a long game. If you want to be in it for a longer time, you've got to see out your you know, healing process mm -hmm. to get to the next day. Like you're saying, you're thinking about next week, thinking of this. If you're thinking a long game, then things heal slowly. And when they take time to heal, they'll be stronger as such thing. But I've, I've snapped my leg and mm. broken Does, shoulders. And I imagine at the time, you know, I've had injuries, although yeah, I had nothing <laughs> compared yeah. to the horrors you boys have faced. But does it feel a bit like a sentence? Like when you're like, this is going to be eight months out. Is it a case of... Like, I felt relieved because <laughs> I was right in the middle of the season. I was super stressed. I had so much things going on. I had a video to shoot, another video. I was doing this contest. I had these shows. I had to do this. I was like, uh, and then gone. Big weight off my shoulders. Yeah, I and imagine. I can just relax and yeah. focus on future goals was, was and healing. Obviously a lot of relief. Yeah. But did you do you feel there was... You know, I imagine you're so, you're so pepped up and these commitments mean something to you, even if they'll make you very stressed, I imagine they mean a great deal to you. Did you feel also feelings of guilt or anything like that? Like, <gasps> guilty to feel relieved? Yeah, especially when you're sponsored yeah. and you are self-employed, because mm -hmm. that's where you are. You get, you think like, oh no, I have a massive injury. It's gonna, I'm gonna lose all my sponsors that mm -hmm. I've been working so hard to get. Mm -hmm. They can just go, nah. Mm -hmm. exactly. they, they're in the contracts if you get given a contract you read it and it says if you're injured for a certain amount of months your pay gets cut by half mm. or your retainer gets cut by half or if you're six months and you're still not back you're out wow. mm. 
I think with like going back to the injury thing again, I think like you can learn so much from injury as well, not only like what your body can do and the pain it can take and how it can heal, but I think the experiences from some of that stuff as well, like when I fell down that big step down, you know, that's like falling 40, 50 feet, mm. pretty scary. And to actually go through that and like be that scared because mm. it was literally like Gonna scary and death in the face. You thought Life you were falling. Yeah, it's literally like coming head to head on head on smash on the motorway and narrowly avoiding it mm. it's being that scared and i think that if you put that into normal life it's like that's not scary that's not scary that's not scary mm. this that yes. was yeah. proper scary i remember one time i was on my bike coming up to a roundabout and i got hit by a car mm-hmm. i was completely my right of way mm-hmm. they just didn't see me and still even now sometimes when driving for instance i'll go <gasps> just yeah. i'll yeah. get like d- is that something i imagine something that essentially traumatic, you know, yeah. staring death in the face. Does that affect you still? Yeah, I think when I go back to that spot, like I've been back there probably five or six times, like sort of almost like ready to do it. And I'm like, I get to that spot and I literally, I know it sounds cliche, but you do have that flashback of mm. falling down there. And literally like when I fell down, I remember this scary moment of like the wind, like whistling past my, usually when you ride a bike with a full face, it's coming in through the front, but mm. this was coming up through my ears, literally like air going, my word. Oh. and you were like so scared, and you can see all these jagged rocks, and it's like, oh my God, I'm going to fall straight into those rocks. But as I say, luckily made it to the knuckle and got mm. down the landing. But yeah, it's just, you learn a lot from that stuff. But, but it still horrible. gives me the shit. No, no, honestly, my Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he has got goosebumps. That is so crazy. Yeah, thinking about it. But in a way, is not is it not incredibly affirming to know that, you know, you can... It's like setup or something like that. You haven't got the right setup if you're sat in the extreme. Mm-hmm. You know you've only got it if you've gone too far and come back a click. Mm-hmm. You know, it must be almost in a way affirming to know, actually, I took it right to the very edge. I went potentially too far. Maybe I could do it now, maybe not. Mm-hmm. But to actually say, that was the definitive, that was breaking point. Yeah. And I got to tell the tale. That's pretty cool to me. I think it is, but I think there is that wasn't the limit to as to what I could have done. It mm. was a mistake in the process. Like mm. you have to like with all that big stuff, you have to prep it so well. And I think you see that at rampage now that these guys spent ages making big run ins, mm. big landings, and you could over jump it, you could come up short on it, but it is there that tolerance is there, whereas that line totally it messed nothing. up. It was mm. nothing it's and horrible. I paid the price. I'm gonna say it again. <laughs> yeah, it's horrible. <laughs> but I think the actual limit wasn't reached. It was the prep that wasn't mm. to match it. Mm. The size you need to go like if you're going that big, you need to make sure everything is ticked off like what ifs. Yes. You know, and it, that wasn't so it was it was pretty disappointing for me because it was yeah. like a pretty mental I can tell the way block. you're talking about it. Mm. Yeah. But you know that thing you said there about what ifs. Now you're both kind of embracing fatherhood. Mm-hmm. You've both got young yeah. kids, yeah. you know, partners does that change anything for you approaching really, you know, either from a, you know, a financial point of view yeah. or just to actually be a good partner and yeah. to be be there to support your children? Does that factor in? It does. I never thought it would. Mm. Being an a- pro athlete, being an athlete, you're super selfish anyway. Mm. You're really selfish because you it's all about you because you want to be at the top of your game. Never buy a round. I've noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. all, you just want to be the best you want to be and you're super competitive. Mm. Now, Jen, my wife, she uh, she was there right at the beginning of my career. So she has followed me throughout about well, 16, 17 years of it now. And uh, she's been there from the beginning, so she understands what it takes, mm. what, knows what's going on. Like if she came in probably halfway through my career, maybe it would be a little bit different because I was quite selfish. I'm always, I'm not at home. Yeah. And now I've got a little man. I'm year year in being a father. Mm-hmm. I've got loads to learn. Mm. And um, I feel like, I'm dedicating a lot more time to him than than doing other things, you know, pursuing mm-hmm. other goals. My goal is pretty much nearly more him and family. That sounds lovely. Mm-hmm. But I think it changes. That yeah. happens to anyone and everyone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's super hard. Like for me, I've got three kids from eight to six months now. So I've got mm-hmm. the oldest is eight and the youngest three months. And I think the hardest thing for me is balancing the time. Mm-hmm. Um, like I used to have literally every day to ride my bike and f- from going from like pro riding every day to like, you know, we ride on our shoots now. Like for this is quite mm-hmm. hard. And uh, as Blake says, I think for me now it's like, I think seeing a smile on your kid's face is more important to me than going and landing a 50 foot step down. And mm. do you know what I mean? That's, that, that, sound, was I, like, yeah. that was my buzz. And I was like, yes, this is mm. amazing. But for me, I get that same buzz from the kids That's now. So like, lovely, I still man. love doing all that riding stuff as well. But for me, that is kind of shifted. And it is a big shift, I think, mm. from when you go from 
rider to dad, it is a big step, mm. especially when you've got like three of them. It's pretty full on. Yeah. Because, I mean, it sounds I like... I've got one. <laughs> <laughs> and sounds... I still don't see him as much. <laughs> it sounds like times are changing in a, in a good way. Mm. You know, that yeah. I think some pro athletes, they yeah. finish their sport and it's like a vacuum. Mm. You know, imagine being a Premier League footballer and scoring in front of 40,000 people week in, week out. Yeah, and sure. one day it stops. Mm. Yeah. Done. But it sounds like you guys have really... Well, you're obviously still riding, still... Biking is your passion. It's a long game. It's the long game. Yeah, if you love it's... cycling that much, you're going to make it last as long as possible. <laughs> and you find other avenues. Yeah. It's not just one discipline <laughs> or yeah. one, what do you call it, genre of sport. Mm. Like, yeah. it's like dirt jumping doesn't last forever. No, no, no. So you've got to think of other things. Yeah, exactly that. And I think we were both super lucky to like come from what we we're doing into another job that we love mm. doing. I think it's always in the back of your mind. It's like, what am I going to do when this ends? Yeah. There's all these little ideas, but it's just, a lot of them aren't like financially viable. And you're like thinking, well, what am I going to do when this ends? And I think towards the end of your career, usually like you start on three-year contracts and that'll go to a two. Then you have like a yearly contract. And That's when like, you start getting worried. Yeah. <laughs> you get to December and you're like, oh my God, is my deal going to happen next year? And you're like, mm, yeah, thank God I got it for another year. And then a big sponsor will drop out and you've got to like, oh, how am I going to make that money up? And it is a big worry. And I think like we were super lucky to move across yes. this and because, it works out well. Because I suppose, you know, you guys were in an era mm -hmm. and it felt there was a definitive moment about 10 years ago, maybe eight, nine years ago. And people start saying, is free ride dead? Do you think we're in a post free ride era if there is such a thing? Or do you think it's still alive and kicking? I don't know if it's dead. It's definitely gone off the radar. But then you could blame that to social media. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of impact being like free ride, yes, media, and all these videos are coming out. They were like the pioneers of mm. free ride sport. All these videos making those. Disorder and stuff yeah, like that. Exactly. Like all a, those yeah. were. That happened. That was a good thing that happened to the sport. And now, with social media, it kind of dictates what you're going to watch. Because mm -hmm. you start, you get lost in it. You start following something. And then if you're following that, the social thing will f make you follow that. Mm -hmm. And then that one thing you were following last week, you feel yes. like it's dead. Yes. Kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But also, I imagine as kind of freelance, self employed, Things like magazine cover shoots mm. were really valuable to you. Now the print media isn't kicking, isn't kicking around so much. Yeah. I imagine you know a, a direct source of income for yeah. self-employed riders has gone. Yeah. Yes, they might be able to get it from that avenue, from mm. that, that revenue as a social media thing, but yeah. it's not the same as come to this quarry, do this yeah, big yeah. jump. And then go I feel like it's there. got diluted as well. Yeah. Social dilutes a lot, Definitely. brings out a lot of people yeah, yeah, to do the same thing. For sure, yeah. I think like a bigger part of my career was, as you mentioned, was print when it first started. Like I used to do loads of shoots for like MB UK and Dirt and things like that and quite a few other mags. But then, as you mentioned, that kind of disappeared. Then it kind of went to like doing loads of like social media stuff, to doing all that mm. free ride stuff like Instagram mm. and Facebook videos. Then your own edits, you know, up to where we are today. Mm. So it has sort of definitely changed the way we I miss those things. days. Mm. Getting like photos, like a uh, front cover was yeah. probably the, my biggest thing yeah. and I'm glad I got it right mm. I would say near the end of it mm. at a dirt front cover at MBK times two wow. two dirt covers yeah yeah that was like a big thing yeah. also that in your contract as a pro yeah. athlete it's worth a lot of money yeah yes. that was the biggest thing in so my contract was literally hard for yeah, yeah. like yeah. print stuff was cool. like big back then and then yeah. it changes like video views and then okay you'd get your all your like win bonuses chucked in and they'd double it and yeah. you know then you'd say you get paid this much per page this much for front cover yeah. this much for like thumbnail pics yeah. it was just it's, like, it was crazy mm. like it wasn't just one sponsor that would give you yeah. a bonus like if you had five or six sponsors that had this bonus scheme in play whew, mm. you could make them three, four months wages in one shoot. Because imagine, yeah, no short of motivation from the athletes. Looking at something like Rampage, there have been some, in my opinion, some really definitive moments. I think of Cam Zink doing that mm. massive step down that he flat dropped. Mm. I was thinking of Kelly McGarry over oh, the canyon, yeah. you know, some really, really cool stuff. And a thing that also sticks out for me as perhaps a catalyst for change was Paul Bagasota's injury. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you, do you think that changed the sport a bit? Or at least the way perhaps the spectator views the sport? I don't know if it, it, it changed uh, maybe the outlook on the sport. Maybe like people started thinking like, well, this is dangerous. Even yeah. though they know it's dangerous, but it put it more into perspective of what could actually go wrong. Just to help people that perhaps aren't familiar. Yeah. Basically, it stems down to how much the event organisers, where their responsibility extends to mm. in terms of rider injury. Do you think that would be fair to describe it as that? Yeah, I yeah, think so. Yeah. And, and if somebody... A few more rules chucked in to make it a little bit more safer. I'm not mm. too sure what goes on behind closed doors. And the rider in this instance had a really nasty injury, you know, life-threatening injury. Mm. And 
medical bills racked up in America. Yeah. Very, imagine that would be absolutely terrifying, especially if you do, I don't know if you had a family and stuff, but you yeah, know, yeah. your house or something could be on the line for yeah. something, I imagine it was a very low moment for him. Yeah. Yeah. You know, do you think event organizers do do enough for their riders? I think they would help support. I'm not too sure what goes on behind mm. there, I, um, but they probably would show support for sure. Yeah, I think they won't events. not just throw them on the streets. Yeah, yeah. Mm. those bigger events definitely give you that kind of um, support as well like when you do get injured. But personally, I've been to some events like over my career that you literally, well, you could die at. Like I've done the. Um, urban downhill out in Taxco, the, the race down there. And literally mm. in practice there, I remember there was like a kicker onto a roof and then mm. had a gap off onto another house and jumped off the house down into the street. Mm. And I was testing it and I over jumped the step down, went to stop before I jumped onto the other house. I couldn't slow down on there because of all the dust and stuff mm. on the roof. I slid across the roof and I was hanging off the roof by one ass cheek, <laughs> holding my downhill bike on like with one hand. And I looked down below and there was uh, this drop of about 20 feet down onto a spiked railing. Yes. So you could have oh. literally skidded right. off the house, fell down and caught that between your right. legs and probably... Thank you God for all, you've got a good set of glutes on you from all those squats there. Chris, man, you've got some purchase. But, <laughs> but yeah, it's just stuff like that. Like those urban downhill races, like... Mm. Literally, really ass was saving I stopped your doing ass. it after that because mm. I was like, I could die at this, mm. literally. Because you did one recently for the channel. Oh, yeah, no, that, was that was scary. Yeah. That is scary. They're good fun, though. They are good fun. Yeah. But you could end yourself there. And I'm not too sure if they could help. Mm. So, yeah. Mm. But because Rampage does seem to be getting more slope styly. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that's for the good? And if so, what would be the direction you'd like the sport to go in? Do you, do you when you see, you know, Brendan Seminuk tricking everything, are you like stoked or do you want to see Brendan? ride the steepest, gnarliest, natural thing? I, you know, I, it's quite a tricky subject. Mm. I think it's a good balance. Excuse the pun. Too. But I think, it, like, when you see, like, Emil Johansson and stuff going down, like, crank works, and you're like, holy, it is um, super impressive. Yeah. But mm. then it's on, it's still massive features, you know, those guys are hitting, like, 12-foot kickers and stuff, mm. still on massive gaps. But I think the location and how exposed you are at, like, sites like Rampage and the bikes, is it is a different sport, totally, mm. I think. It is a different sport. But, yeah, um, being... Back in the day, it was all about the crazy line shoot into a big gap with not much lip. Nowadays, it's quite, it is trick orientated a little bit, but there is so much you could watch a guy going down a mountain skidding, which a lot of people would think they are not watching the sport or follow the sport. They're like, oh, this guy's just skidding down some yeah. crazy ass mountain. Mm. But if he does skid, 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 and then does a humongous flip over this great big canyon, then everyone's like, whoa, well, yeah. this is insane. It's more tangible, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it, I think bringing tricks into it makes it, mm. makes it more watchable because it's not mountain bikers that will be watching it. There's gonna be the, like potentially like a lot of other folks. Yeah. I remember once being stood in a shop and it was a new old disorder that was playing on like the TV on loop. Mm. Yeah. And I think it was in, you know, those massive stuff they do in like cam loops, just those huge grease loops. Yeah. Or, you know, absolutely gnarly. I think it was um uh Graham Agus's like carving his mm. way down. Yeah. And this guy in the shop just started telling saying like, you know, as a as a consumer of the media, yeah. he was like, That's not that hard though, is it? I could do that. And yeah. I tried to explain just how, you know, how exactly. steep it was. Just getting, you know, you're constantly yeah, fighting yeah, yeah, yeah. and finding grip. Yeah. He was like, yeah, but it's basically just winding down something steep. You just yeah. drag the brakes a bit. So that's why you bring in stunts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was, yeah. And totally. people are like, well, I could skid down that. And then, oh, and hell no, I'm going to do that flip, flip that. Yeah. jump. Well, that. that's what I think Kelly McGarry, that backflip mm, went, exactly. was one of the first viral things, yeah, yeah. really. And like G doing that step down that was hipped. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. Well, that sort of stuff mm. really was mind blowing. Yeah, which I think kicked off bringing those slope style dudes over. Look, look mm. Nick, mm. Nick Lyragakin. Yeah. The dude was born in a skate park. He was a BMXer. Mm. And then he moved into mountain biking. And now look at him, he's hitting the slopes of Rampage and yeah. doing his stunts there, which. Is gnarly, mm -hmm. but then I would I would like to see a bit of both, you know, yeah. skids into a, a gnarly. I would see Brendan thing. score higher, if I'm honest with you. What yeah, do you think, Chris? Sure. I, I would think, say that. Yeah. I think going back to Blake's comment, uh, like with Nikolai riding Rampage, that's where you can see the difference mm -hmm. in the sport. Like Nikolai is an amazing slope style athlete. Mm -hmm. You know, he's literally top three every time or yeah. top five. Mm -hmm. But first run at Rampage you know, crashes massively near that legendary mm. cliff fall. And it just shows you the difference in the style of the mm. riding and how different it actually is. Like, mm. take, you know, one like, of the guys that won Rampage, yeah. a Rampage and take them to, like, the slope style contest. Mm. They'd probably just go straight airs and maybe a table and mm. a 360. But, you know, it just shows you the vice versa of, like, how different it Bike is. Bike handling. Yeah. yeah. Different. 
for me starting here you know my passion is endurance cycling mm -hmm. and i've managed to kind of I can see that. twist a few <laughs> arms and kind of wing it so i could do some of that sort of content do you guys still have that kind of the burn in your loins for sending some big jumps or are you kind of more satisfied with <sighs> definitely 100 yeah. Yeah. percent. yeah i get super excited when you know i, I just traveling around and i'm like on google maps and i see like a quarry and i'm like oh <laughs> geologist <laughs> chris yeah, yeah, i'll go check it out because that could be like the best step down or the biggest mm. jump in there ever you know the best line and it's just things like that the yeah, best dirt to schwab exactly mm. so it's yeah definitely high on the radar i've uh, i've done it yes i wanted to do dark fest dark fest uh i used I did, well, Dark Fest is one of those fest series, massive jumps. This one is in out in South Africa, in Cape Town, and it's all about big jumps. And I really wanted to hit big jumps and do some content around it. So I do kind of have the burn to do these things. Mm -hmm. Like, I would like to go to Rampage, and I would like to not ride it, but to go there to see what it's like, mm -hmm. to ride some of those shoots, and basically do videos on how to be a free rider. That's, mm -hmm. I really want to do cool. more that stuff like super that. super cool, yeah. yeah. Because do you think, you know, what's something, you know, I've always found amazing is a, an example, somebody that I think is criminally underrated is someone like Conor McFarlane, mm -hmm. yeah. who's just amazing. But also, you know, he's an enduro rider. He, he can flat drop pretty much anything. Yeah, yeah. You know, someone like him is kind of struggling to get into Rampage year in, year out. Yeah. Do you think that the way that we kind of, um, you know, because I'm sure if, if you guys were to make a video on free ride mm -hmm. like you know doing it it would be absolutely fantastic yeah. and it would be really really well received throughout I, I have no doubts about that but do you think there's kind of in that upper echelon there perhaps isn't enough room for all these top riders i think so there's a, there's well, how many go into it 20? not that many yeah not many and now they have this yeah. thing called proving grounds mm. that you have to prove yourself mm -hmm. to get a wild card to go and actually do rampage mm. there's a lot there there's like yeah. that's a whole event in itself yeah totally. so it's like those people want to do that so there's yeah it it's just it's really hard to be at the top yeah i think the um video submission thing they used to do a few years back was probably just as maybe even better than like proving grounds because mm. you've got some of those guys that are some amazing riders out there especially mm. in like these smaller countries that simply can't travel or don't mm. have the money yes. to go to things like proving grounds or sponsors to send them there yeah. that i think if you just submitted a video and edit Although, you know, it might take multiple shots to get that line dialed, it would show mm. your potential. And I think that's something that's a lot more achievable by a mm. lot more people. So I guess I guess it's probably the, you know, the double edged sword mm. of the progression within the sport. It seemed like when Wade Simmons won that first one, yeah. I mean he, I believe he actually crashed on the way down. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure they just turned up with, you know, a husky box and a few beers and some sandwiches. Oh. You know, some cut off <laughs> jeans and we're like and you know, you've got a huge array of riders. Yeah. You also got a lot of racers, mm -hmm. but that yeah. wasn't their sole income, so I imagine that probably made it a bit flexible in terms mm. of travel, etc. But it's certainly educated a lot. And, well, sorry, it's, sorry, it's changed a lot and people's uh, sort of impressions of what the sport should be. Mm. But I guess for me, when I see those really talented riders that don't get a spot, I always think, oh, mm. you, you know, they're so Poor good guy. though. Yeah. They're so good. Mm. It's Poor a shame guy. to see. And I think like the reserve list is always good, you know, because you mm. get a lot of people get injured. Like mm. a few people this year have got injured on the yeah. lead up to it practicing. Uh, BMVN is nine. BMVN... Bonito, Bonito, I've mm. kind of had to say it. He's a Spanish guy. Yeah. G. Atherton's out, so he's the next one in. Emil's in. Emil Johansson. He's and, in. Antoine Bizet wow. is out as well. Antoine Bizet. Yeah, Antoine yeah, Bizet. He broke in. his arm, didn't he? He broke his arm, yeah. Mm. So that leaves. I think that gives Emil his space, actually. So. Okay. Well, and Emil's a full. He, what? Well, he's insane. Yeah. Should, we, should we hashtag the hashtag GMPM for Rampage? <laughs> Get your boys over there. <laughs> <laughs> Careful now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll be part of someone's dig team. Yeah. <laughs> I'll do that. Perfect. Yeah. But Rampage, for those that don't know, is on in just a few short weeks mm. and it's going to be really, really exciting. Thank you very much for your time, guys. Oh, thank you your very much. thoughts Enjoy and it. feelings and yeah. it's been really interesting to get those insights. Yeah, um, so. As always, guys, thanks for listening. Don't forget to like and subscribe and you can check this out on any of your kind of podcast listening services of choice, Spotify, etc. It's all on there. So thank you very much and we'll see you next time. <laughs>